Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Leifer. I'm the director of the USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. Along with my colleague, Kimberly Young, I'd like to thank you for joining us for tonight's event, Heart Disease in Pets as They Age with Dr. Samantha Kochi. Tonight's event will be recorded and we'll send out a link tomorrow in case you miss anything or would like to watch it again. We'll be taking questions via chat and we'll be sure to leave some time at the end of the presentation to answer as many as possible. So tonight's event will focus on acquired heart diseases, which are conditions that develop throughout a pet's life. Uh, this past March, we hosted a lecture on congenital heart disease, which focused on conditions present at birth. You'll find that lecture, along with recordings of all our past lecture, on our YouTube channel and on our website. Um, we'll include those links in the follow-up email that we send out tomorrow. I'd like to take a quick moment and just let everyone know about an upcoming event on Wednesday, June 28th at 6 p.m., we will host a webinar on brachiocephalic airway syndrome featuring Dr. Daniel Spector, senior veterinarian specialist in surgery at AMC. You can register for that event on our website, amcny.org slash events. We'll also have the link in our newsletter that goes out tomorrow night. And now I am very excited to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Samantha Kochi is a board certified cardiologist who earned her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine at the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine in Columbus, Ohio, and completed a small animal rotating internship at Tufts University Foster Hospital for Small Animals in North Grafton, Massachusetts. Dr. Kochi then returned to Ohio State to complete a cardiology residency. She joined Schwarzman Animal Medical Center's very busy cardiology service in September of 2022. Um, we are thrilled to have her at AMC and grateful to have her with us to lead tonight's event. Please welcome Dr. Samantha Kochi. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Michelle. Glad to be here. All right. So let's get started because I have a, a lot to go through. Um, let me make sure I share everything well for you guys. Okay. Good. All right. Still see my um, starting slide? Yes. Looks Perfect. Good. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. So I'm going to try to make this as um, visually pleasing. <laughs> for everybody involved, um, but definitely type in questions in the chat as, as you come um, or think of them. If you know we can't get to them, potentially, I guess there's, there's ways we could always answer things that are really critical um, afterwards, but I'll definitely try to address every, everything that people would like to know more about. Um, so we are going to delve into this next hour um, talking about heart disease in pets as they age. So kind of another term that you might see out there is acquired heart disease um, in our small animal patients. So essentially focusing on cats and dogs tonight. So how we'll kind of run through um, is starting with a definition of, you know, what are we talking about when we speak about acquired heart disease? Um, for everyone involved, you know, why would your pet potentially need a consultation, um, whether they're middle age, older, et cetera, um, what to expect when you come for a visit, especially since, you know, I, I don't know everyone's knowledge base of what normals look like versus not. Um, so I'll go through a little bit of some normals just so that people have a little bit of familiarity of what things look like. Um, the good news is that they do have the same heart structure as us. So if you have some knowledge base there, that can definitely be helpful. What we are focusing on when we do our physical exams. Um, and then I just put on here some of the more common things that we do see um, and some nice pictures of that. I think especially for a lot of our owners even, with, with the construction, it makes it a little bit more tricky, but I, I wish that we had a better way that we can physically show you a lot more um, than we do right now. So if I have any of my clients here, maybe, you know, by seeing some of this, you'll get to understand what I'm talking about when I go through the diseases with you guys. There's definitely many more things that are out there that we see, um, some things that are even more complex. So, you know, maybe in future lectures, I can get into some of those topics as well. Um, but I figured these are kind of the more common things that many people might have some sort of experience with. So 
will do degenerative valve disease, which is myxomatous valve disease, dilated cardiomyopathy, tumors of the heart and effusion, which is fluid building up around the heart or, or the lungs, um, the various heart muscle disorders of cats, congestive heart failure, um, and various arrhythmias or abnormal heartbeats that can occur. So kind of the big question in case people kind of, you know, weren't familiar with what what does acquired heart disease actually mean um, versus congenital heart disease that my colleague, Dr. Tobrowski had spoken about. So these are going to be conditions that your pet develops after they're born. It's not something that they had when they were, you know, directly born and had this malformation. It's something that has developed over time, which sometimes can be quite early. We can definitely see acquired heart diseases, unfortunately, happen in a few months of age, um, you know, sometimes six month old patients, sometimes they're 10 years old. So it's a wide range of ages that we can definitely see when we talk about acquired heart disease. Um, some of those causes that we're going to be seeing are going to be degenerative changes, which are probably some of the most common things. Many of these diseases have genetic predispositions for various breeds. Um, Various of the actual myocardial, so heart muscle disorders, um, can just be primary. A lot of those are, are going to have a genetic component, many of which we don't know the actual genetic component, but some we do. So um, a lot of that is actually helpful because we can test for that if, if people would like. Um, diet. Um, I think a lot of people may have some familiarity with talks of that. So I have a slide on it. Um, I think especially that will be helpful that I'll give some more information of resources of where people can get more information on because I think that in and of itself is probably a whole lecture alone. Um, infectious agents that can impact the heart. So whether they're by the bacteria, viruses, etc. Um, scarring, which is fibrosis is kind of more of the medical term for that. Then, especially what we see here a lot, um, I'd say mostly in our cats, um, compared to anywhere else that I've worked, I see the systemic illnesses, so diseases of elsewhere in the body, really impacting the heart pretty commonly. Um, and it can be quite severe, and it can be really challenging to you know, figure out what's going on, how do we treat that, but also treat the other main problem that the pet is experiencing. So anemia or low red blood cells, there's various endocrine diseases related to the thyroid, related to the adrenal glands, cats with hyperthyroidism, we see them commonly on the cardiology service, um, various diseases within the abdomen. So if there's a tumor on the spleen, um, GDV, which is when the stomach flips, a lot of large breed dogs could have issues with that, um, hypertension or high blood pressure, that has a negative impact on the heart. Lots of respiratory diseases, the, the right side of the heart is going to pump to the lungs. So there's that direct communication there. So the heart can take a hit for sure in regards to having to battle against some of these respiratory conditions. Um, electrolytes, potassium, sodium, um, magnesium, all of these things, if they're off for various other conditions that the pet is dealing with, can impact the heart in a negative way that, you know, we have to then jump in and try to help with in addition, um, and steroids that many patients need for so many different diseases um, can definitely take a hit on the heart. So I'd say a lot of these ones in particular, we see, especially in cats, some of these cats that are, you know, chronic illness cats, your pet might see internal medicine. Um, we see a lot of those pets that wind up having their heart be impacted by some of these other things going on, um, as well as cancers, just like every area of the body, unfortunately, and it could be primary of the heart muscle or metastatic, meaning that it's spread to the heart coming from somewhere else. Um, there's other things as well, but see, these are some of the main ones that, that we're going to be dealing with and working with. So, you know, what are the various reasons that your pet might be seeing us in cardiology? Um, some of it might just be you know, you, you think your pet's doing totally fine, but you go to your primary care for just a routine wellness exam, or maybe they're having some sort of clinical sign that you don't know what it's coming from. Um, but then they tell you, hey, I found such and such. Um, I recommend that you go see a consultation um, with one of the cardiologists. So some of those things that they might bring up to you is a heart murmur, which is hearing turbulent blood flow within the heart. A gallop sound is an additional heart sound different than the typical lub-dub lub -dub that we think about when we hear a heart beating. 
arrhythmias, which are abnormal heartbeat. So I'll have at the end um, various things that we see in regards to arrhythmias, but we have a normal conduction system and we know how those beats are going to traverse through the heart muscle. Um, whereas these ones are going to be coming from a different location or have some issue in regards to that conduction through the heart. Um, maybe your vet took chest x-rays and noticed that the heart looked really big, or maybe there was a particular area of the heart that you just kind of see the outer border there that looked a little bit abnormal that they recommend you following up with a cardiologist for. Um, we can 100% see a lot of respiratory signs develop from significant heart disease, um, and maybe your pet is showing those signs and your vet says, hey, I think this is actually from his or her heart, um, and you should get that evaluated further. Congestive heart failure, which is fluid accumulating as a result of severe heart disease, um, heartworm disease, which same thing, I wanted to add that in as a discussion today, but there was just not time because that that as well has tons of information. So I think similarly, that can be another um, another separate lecture, but a lot of people come to see us in regards to their pet having heartworm disease. Thankfully, many of them are very asymptomatic, um, but some can be very, very ill and quite critical. So that might be another, you know, reason that we'll, we're seeing you guys. Um, if there's concerns that there's a tumor on the heart or potential for a tumor on the heart and cardiac biomarkers, which are essentially, um, things that can come up in the, on your pet's blood work. Um, your vet may specifically order it. Sometimes some senior panels just contain some of these biomarkers. Some of those are called, um, a pro BMP is one that we see commonly, as well as a cardiac troponin I. Um, the BMP, I would say we see people getting referred for much more commonly, um, and that's going to be testing for stretch of the heart muscle. There are other things that can impact both of these values, the BNP and the troponin. So the best news that we could always give someone is that, you know, they may come to see us because those values are off. We look into their heart, looks looks normal, looks good. Um, so, you know, we could definitely have some of these false positives or other things. Sometimes kidney disease can cause the BNP to elevate. Um, so it's always good to give good news, but that may be another indication that your vet has to kind of send you guys our way. Now things for you guys to notice at home, um, and even if your pet does have heart disease, things that I'm sure you've heard many of us kind of go through of what we want you to watch for um, is coughing. That's a, a very big thing, especially in dogs. Most cats with heart disease aren't going to cough as a result, but definitely some can. So definitely keep that in mind if you're a cat owner. Breathing really fast, breathing with more effort. We see that a lot when we have our patients that are in congestive heart failure and they're having fluid that's accumulating in their lungs or around their lungs. Um, fainting or collapse episodes. And there's so many different causes to that. Sometimes it can be really challenging to differentiate, is this a fainting episode or is it a seizure? or Are they weak for some other reason? Um, so you might hear us inquiring a lot about, tell us exactly what you saw or how did they look immediately before, immediately after? Because we're really trying to figure out, was this an actual fainting or syncopal episode? Um, or is it something else? And we want to make sure that we are addressing the appropriate problem. If they seem exercise intolerant, again, that's that's pretty vague, right? So, you know, it could be that they're, they have arthritis. A lot of our patients that we see are, are older um, and they do have bad arthritis and they might not wanna go for these long walks anymore. But if they do have um, changes with their heart muscle or their valves and, you know, their heart is just not as efficient as it used to be, they can be get pretty quiet um, on their walks and might wanna slow down a lot. So, you know, if you're not able to do as much as you used to be with your pet and your vet maybe had noted, hey, I, I hear do, I do hear a heart murmur, that would be a reason that we'd wanna see um, him or her just to make sure that there's not anything severe going on with their heart. Um, the other two, I have the little asterisks for because they are also very vague. So lethargy, if they're just more quiet, more tired, almost every single, especially severe disease, whether it's the heart or elsewhere in the body can definitely cause a patient to be lethargic. But if we know that your pet has heart disease and then they develop lethargy, we should be on kind of the radar of, of knowing about that. Um, and then in cats, especially if they have an acute inability to use one of their limbs or numerous limbs, um, I'll go through that as well, but we could definitely see cats, unfortunately, throw clots and obstruct blood flow to their legs um, or elsewhere. Sometimes it can go to their brain. They can have a seizure. They can lose vision. Um, 
you know, in regards to the inability to use a limb, it's not the only thing that can cause that, you know, it could be that they have a soft tissue injury. It could be that they have a fracture. Um, but you know, it's, it's something that we definitely need to be aware of for these guys. So what should you expect if you come here or you go elsewhere to see a cardiologist um, is somebody is going to initially speak to you and, and get a thorough history from you. A lot of times our service is really good about getting the records from your primary care so we can kind of scope out a little bit beforehand what potentially could be going on or what's bringing you guys here. Um, but we want to you know, try to gather that information as best as possible. We'll do a physical exam, really focusing on the heart and the lungs. We're going to look at everything, but um, a lot of times people ask us, hey, what'd you think of their ears? What'd you think of their eyes? And we're really focusing all of our attention really on the, the heart and the lungs. We could tell you if we think that there's something maybe a little bit off that we recommend your primary care look into, um, but our, our biggest focus is making sure that that heart is, is quite healthy. Um, and then there's lots of diagnostics, even listed here. I don't even have everything listed on, on there, but we'll kind of choose our diagnostics based on the history, based on what we're finding on our exam. Um, if your vet already did some of these diagnostics, we may or may not have to do them again. Um, but an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of, of the heart, um, an electrocardiogram, in humans, we'll use the term EKG. You'll hear us use the term ECG a lot. Um, so that's gonna monitor the heart rhythm. Um, a Holter monitor, I have a picture at the end of, that's a little vest that your pet can wear in the home setting to really show us their rhythm over a full 24, 48 plus hours because these arrhythmias can be so sporadic and so intermittent that we don't wanna miss something just because we don't see it while they're in hospital. It could mean that they are still having something at home. So it really optimizes our ability to catch something. Uh, monitor their blood pressure. A lot of people kind of get a kick out of this and we do it just like you or I going to the doctor. We have our little cuffs that we put on their legs, um, different sizes for the different size animal that it is. Um, and there are various different types of blood pressures that we could do. We prefer Doppler in cardiology, but there's oscillometric, there's various other ones that are out there. Um, and we're going to make sure that that blood pressure is appropriate. Um, thoracic radiographs, which are chest x-rays. Um, those are our you know, one of our biggest things that we are commonly doing, especially when we're looking to see are there areas in the lungs that we're concerned about of fluid, et cetera. Um, and blood work, variable, depending on what we're needing to look for. A lot of times we're checking kidney values and electrolytes in patients that are on heart failure medications. Um, but there are lots of other things that we need to look into depending on what we're finding. We might wanna check a thyroid level. We might wanna check that red blood cell count if they are anemic. Um, if they are really sick otherwise, um, they might have a fever. Maybe I wanna see their white blood cell count. So there's various other blood panels that we may or may not need to do depending on what that pet is, is showing us. So kind of to, to start, just to kind of put everyone a little bit more on the same page, um, just a few slides that I have on normals before we get into more of the actual diseases. Um, I'll probably go through this a little bit quickly, um, just so I can show you guys some of the more fun stuff. Um, but this one, if you guys watch Dr. Toborowski's um, lecture, he had the same same image, so may look familiar from that. Um, but the heart has two sides, a right side, which is the blue, a left side, which is the red. There's a top and bottom chamber on each side. So we have right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. Um, the right ventricle is going to pump blood out the pulmonary artery, which is this vessel here. The left ventricle is going to pump blood out the aorta. So the way that blood flows on through is that from the body, it's going to return to the heart into the right atrium through the vena cava. So we have the superior vena cava here, the inferior vena cava here, bringing blood from the top half of the body and then the bottom half of the body into the right atrium. So we have that as blue because it's not going to have as much oxygen it's gonna pass this little gray structure that you may see here, that's called the tricuspid valve. That's gonna open on up, bring that blood into the right ventricle. And then you'll notice that there's this pink or red area um, that's thicker than what you notice on the top. And that's because the ventricles are the pumping chambers. So the muscle air is thicker. Um, so that right ventricle is gonna pump, bring that blood out the pulmonary artery to the lungs. Then from the lungs, it, it's going to go into these pulmonary veins, bring blood back to the heart. It's now going to have oxygen, which is why it's red, into the left atrium, 
this gray structure here is the mitral valve. That's going to open, allow that blood to go into the left ventricle. The left ventricle is always a little bit thicker than the right ventricle, unless they have a certain different disease that's going on. Um, but that's going to pump blood out the aorta to the rest of the body. So that is going to be the, the typical structure and, and function of what we see for a normal, normal heart. Um, and a lot of that, you'll be able to kind of twist this heart on its side um, and be able to quasi uh, be able to identify some of the chambers on the echocardiogram images that I have, which is the ultrasound of the heart images. So hopefully that's helpful to at least start with. Um, next, I just have for a little bit of familiarity as well, some x-rays. Um, so this is normal for a dog. Um, we usually take a combination of three views, but just for space on the slide, I just have the two. Um, so this is a dog lying on his right side. So that's where we have the, the R for the marker. Um, the head is this way. This is the diaphragm, the abdomen. This grayer structure here is the heart. Um, this tubular structure is the trachea. The darker areas around the heart are the lungs. Um, so you can kind of see generally how high that heart is going to go within the chest cavity. Um, the trachea kind of angles a little bit more down when we have a normal size heart. The lungs are going to look this darker color. Um, and then we have these little lines that you can kind of see here, which are vessels coming from the heart. And we pay close attention to those too, because those can change depending on the, the status of the patient's heart. Um, this one on the right is the same pet just lying on his back. Head is up here, abdomen is down here. Um, similarly, the dark areas are gonna be the lungs and then the heart is sitting smack there in the middle. The right side of the dog's chest is on actually the left side of our screen and the left side is on our right side. Next is the same exact thing, just in a cat. Um, so I won't go through everything in extreme detail, but you can just kind of see their confirmation is a little bit different. Um, and even dogs, obviously, we see so many different chest shapes. If you think about a bulldog compared to a greyhound, they're definitely going to look different in, in what I just showed you. But um, a, a cat chest is going to be a lot more slender, a lot more narrow, um, but this is a normal cat chest, um, but we still have those darker areas for the lungs, the heart smack there in the in the middle, and this is that cat lying on his back, um, and the darker areas for the lungs showing that they're nice and, and clear there. And lastly, in regards to normals, because I'm going to go through a lot of echocardiograms with you guys, which are the ultrasounds of the heart, but I just wanted you to see some of the more common views that we are actually getting. Um, so this one here we call the right parasternal long axis four chamber view. So this is the heart kind of lying on its side. We have the left atrium, the top left chamber on of the heart, the bottom left chamber, the left ventricle. You could see this floppy thing here. This is actually the mitral valve. And then in the near field up here, this is the right atrium, tricuspid valve, and right ventricle. You could see those, those ventricles being the pumping chambers and the good squeeze that they have there. Underneath is the right parasternal short axis at the level of the papillary muscles. Um, so this is kind of if I cut this top view right across here and kind of spun it around and looked at, at it myself. Um, so we have this is the left ventricle, and then this crescent up here is the right ventricle. So left ventricle, right ventricle. Um, and then these bumps that we call papillary muscles are actually gonna grab to these little strings called the chordae tendineae and hold on to the mitral valve. Um, you just can't see those in this view. But similarly, we're gonna really assess that pump ability and assess for dilation of the heart. Um, this view here is actually at the base of the heart. So it's cutting a little bit more up here um, on the heart itself. So this is actually the aorta, that big vessel that's leaving the left side of the heart, bringing blood to the body. This is the left atrium. So that's right here. The right atrium, that's this one, right ventricle. And then starting to come in a little bit of the pulmonic valve um, and pulmonary artery. Lastly, this view that I have here, this is called M mode. Um, so this is just a two-dimensional representation of, of what we're seeing. So, and it's a still image. Um, so what I do is kind of in this short axis view on the bottom left, I kind of drop a line down um, and 
get that to then play across. So if I were to look at this, you can kind of see a little mini version up at the top here. Um, so this gray area that I'm kind of tracing is called the inner ventricular septum, which is that wall that's separating the two ventricles, the bottom chambers of the heart. The black area is the blood within the left ventricle. So that's what we see here as well. Then this gray area at the bottom is the free wall of the left ventricle, that outer wall. And then that bright line is the pericardial sac. So the sac that normally is surrounding the heart muscle. Then what are we doing when we're when we're listening to these cats and dogs? Um, so we're going to be listening to both sides of the chest and paying close attention there. Um, I have just kind of labeled here the head of the dog is to the left. Um, the PV is pulmonic valve, AV is aortic valve, and MV is mitral valve. Um, so these are kind of the general locations of where we're going to be listening. If we hear something abnormal, it can kind of help us with differentiating, okay, if I hear a murmur or swishing sound back here, maybe there's a leak at the mitral valve versus if I hear it across the pulmonary valve, um, maybe there is a congenital lesion and they have some narrowing of that valve. Um, I just have the side view of an x-ray just to also kind of better differentiate that. Um, and kind of a term that I used when I was learning um, is something called PAM 345. So pulmonary valve, aortic valve, mitral valve. And then this is just kind of giving us the rib spaces that in general we're using to really hear those valves the best. So again, help us to differentiate when we hear an abnormality, where exactly we are and potentially which area of the heart might be impacted. Then on the right side, the main area that we're going to be focusing on is, is the tricuspid valve. Um, you'll see VSD listed here, which is one of the congenital lesions that we'll also hear typically on the right side of the chest. Now this, I hope that this works for you guys. Um, so these are just some sounds that we're that we're going to be hearing. So the normal um, is going to sound just like us if when we're listening to the heart beating. So just to have you guys have a little bit of ex experience with that. So S1 is the first heart sound, so that's the lub. S2 is the second heart sound, um, so that's the dub. So see if you can kind of appreciate those. That worked for everybody? Okay, good. Um, so I just kind of have a visual representation of that here. This is actually an EKG. Um, what I'm circling here, this is a full heartbeat. So this um, area of the heartbeat is actually when blood is being ejected. And that's when we're hearing the lub and the dub. So S1 is at the beginning of that. S2 is at the completion of that. Um, so that's exactly what we're hearing with those, those com combination of beats. Then a systolic heart murmur. So systole is going to be when blood is being ejected from the heart. Um, and MR stands for mitral regurgitation. So a leak across the mitral valve. And that's going to be the first disease that we'll go into because we see it so, so commonly. But um, we scale those murmurs from zero to six. Zero is going to be no murmur. Six is the loudest. Um, and we're going to essentially be hearing a swishing sound between the S1 and the S2 sounds. So this might be something that we are hearing when we're listening. And you could see it's pretty hard to actually hear the actual S1, S2 sound. Um, when the murmur is really soft, we usually can still hear it. But as that murmur increases in severity, it, it definitely gets obliterated by the sound of that murmur. We have gallop sounds. Um, we'll hear an S3 gallop in a patient in congestive heart failure, for example. Not every single patient, but some of them we will, or maybe with really bad dilated cardiomyopathy. An S4 sound is actually pretty common that we'll hear in a cat with a cardiomyopathy just from that ventricle, that bottom chamber being so stiff. Um, so it kind of, you hear more than just the lub dub. It's called a gallop because it literally sounds like a horse galloping. Um, so I'll play the S3 first. and then the S4. So we'll hear that S4 very, very commonly here in a lot of the cats that we are, are seeing.
Atrial fibrillation is um, a common arrhythmia that we'll hear. Um, people get that as well. People may be familiar with that. Um, cats are going to have a higher heart rate in general than dogs, um, but this rhythm is going to be really chaotic and it's going to be kind of hard to track the pattern of it. So you can kind of see as you're listening to it, how that sounds. Some people say it sounds like tennis shoes in a dryer, or I always think that it, when I'm hearing a pet with it, I feel like I'm in a like at a basketball court and a bunch of people are bouncing their basketballs at the same time. It just sounds all over the place. And then in a dog. And a lot of times, honestly, these recordings are actually um, much better controlled than some of the patients that we have coming in. This rhythm is classically, especially when it's first diagnosed, is very, very fast. Um, so it can sound even more dramatic. And then lastly, crackles that we're hearing in the lungs. Um, so it starts off with a person speaking, and it kind of says how when you hear a beep, that's when the person is um breathing on in, but this is what we're hearing when we hear the crackles in the lungs, which we'll hear when there's fluid that's present within the lungs. The beeping sound at the beginning of some of these recordings denotes onset of inspiration. Some patients that we see, especially some of our smaller breed dogs that have a chronic cough, they may always have these crackles um, just from some scarring that's present to the lungs. However, the main thing that we in cardiology are paying attention to is when there's fluid that's there and we want to ideally have that fluid be resolved. So we might have a patient that we pick up in the morning that's been hospitalized that the night before they heard these crackles in the lungs, they were treated aggressively um, with diuretics. And then maybe by the morning when we, when we see them in cardiology, those crackles are gone and they're clear indicative of the fluid being resolved at that point, which would be best case scenario. Some other views of some of the diagnostics that we're doing. Um, so this is exactly how we're doing a blood pressure on these guys. So ideally, we want them lying on their side. Um, they have a little cuff on their arm. We're ideally going to try to use one of the forelimbs, um, use the leg that's on the top aspect. Um, this is what we're going to use to inflate and actually read what that actually blood pressure is. So as we inflate, we're going to lose our signal of hearing the blood pressure, and then we're going to slowly deflate the cuff. When that signal comes back, wherever the little lever is, that's what that blood pressure is. Um, this is the, the Doppler that I mentioned is what we typically prefer. This is how we lie patients on their side to get an EKG. So the most optimal way is for them to be lying on their right side like this. You'll notice that the leads that we call them, which are the wires are different colors. And it's actually important to make sure that they are on the appropriate legs. Um, so the right arm is going to have the white, the black is going to be on the left arm. Then we have the green on the right back leg and red on the opposite. All right, so getting into our diseases. So one of the most, most common things that we're seeing, I'd say at least 75 plus percent of patients that we see on an every single day basis have this condition. Um, so you, you may or may not have seen this term or various other terms out there, um, but myxomatous valvular disease, degenerative valve disease, chronic valvular disease, endocardiosis, they all mean the same thing, um, but it is the, the most common thing that we're seeing in our dogs that come into the clinic. So Again, most common acquired heart disease that we see in dogs, um, it's at least 75% in, in North America. The smaller breed dogs are going to have it at a higher prevalence than some of the larger breeds, but we definitely still see it in larger breed dogs. Unfortunately, there is some data that the larger breeds may progress a little bit more quickly than some of the smaller breeds. Um, by 13-ish, at least, at least 80% or 85% have this condition um, to varying degrees. It is related to age-related changes that are occurring to the valves. Um, 
it you may just be impacting the mitral valve. That's the most common. Um, at least 30% also have the tricuspid valve on the right side impacted. Um, it is not uncommon for them both to be impacted at all. I feel like way more than 30% that we see have both valves impacted. Um, just for some kind of interest, I included this on here. Um, so there's actually various layers of the valve. Um, so this spongiosa fibrosa, those are going to be some of the layers of the actual valve itself, if you were to be looking at that under a microscope. Um, so those are the layers that the, are the most impacted with this disease as that degeneration occurs. Um, the extracellular matrix is part of that tissue that forms the valve. Um, and there's going to be expansion of that with these substances called proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans. Um, the fibrosa layer actually is lost a bit as this disease progresses, um, but the entire valve apparatus can be impacted. So um, you can see here on, on the normal heart, um, when I say apparatus, we have the valve tissue itself. Um, I have a couple um, actual heart images. Um, not too gross for you guys to, to see, but you can actually visualize this, I think, a lot better. But these strings here are those chordae tendinae that I was mentioning before. So those can also be impacted, I'd say, pretty frequently. Um, and then there's those muscles, the, those papillary muscles, if you remember from that short axis view, kind of shot on up. Um, everything can really be impacted with this disease. It is progressive, um, usually over a period of years, but the rate is quite variable. So it's really hard when we just see a patient one time to know exactly how that's going to change for them and at what rate is that going to change. Um, so we definitely need to keep a close eye on these guys over time. Um, cavaliers are going to be predisposed to this condition at with development at a, a younger age than many other breeds, but any breed can develop this condition. Um, over time, we see volume overload that develops depending on the side of the heart that's impacted. So typically what that means is that the mitral valve, this one on the left side is the most commonly affected. So volume overload is going to be because of that leak that's occurring across the mitral valve. It's bringing this extra blood or extra volume to the top chamber because it's squirting backwards. That's what we're hearing when we hear the heart murmur. Um, since that is squirting to the top chamber, the top chamber increases in volume. Since blood's normally passing from top to bottom, that bottom is then getting extra volume. So that heart starts to stretch over time. As it's stretching, it can only do that so much and the pressures are going to increase, especially on the left side, we see the left atrial pressures increasing. It's going to congest those pulmonary veins. So those are the vessels that are coming from the lungs, trying to bring blood into the left atrium, but it's kind of this opposite effect where it's kind of pushing on back and you can develop fluid in the lungs or cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So these are um, images of some normal valves um, actually from my colleague, Dr. Fox, this is a really, really good paper. Um, if you guys are, are interested, that has just beautiful images um, to better visualize everything. So this, you can see the is that valve tissue, just nice and thin, pretty translucent. Um, these are those strings, the chordae tendinae that are holding on down. And then the P is the papillary muscle. There's various importances of the chordae tendinae. Um, if you have had time to kind of look in here, there's first order, second order. Um, and, you know, if we have one of the first order ones or any that are kind of more important with holding onto that valve, um, if those break, we can have a lot bigger of a leak because um, it's really not being tethered down as tightly as it used to be. Just kind of another view um, looking on through. So the top chamber on the left side, and it's kind of this more power chute kind of angling on down into that bottom chamber, but nice shiny glistening tissue. Um, those little strings, the chordae tendinae, and then the P for papillary muscle um, down there in, in the ventricle. Then this is going to be a valve that's impacted with disease. So you could see how much thicker the edges of those leaflets are. Um, these cords are thicker than they should be as well. They look a little bit more stretched on out. Um, there's a lot of billowing of these valves, like they're kind of buckling on up. Um, you could see how fat this or this chordae tendinae actually is. Um, 
in this view, you actually see a broken one that's present here. This wasn't even something that was just from dissection. It actually was broken. Um, this is that top chamber on the left side of the heart. And we can see really severe changes that can happen that with that chamber stretching so much, that leak can really be smacking on hard onto the inner aspect of the wall of the left atrium. And it could actually cause tears in that left atrial wall. So you can see a, a split here as well as here. And in some patients that can actually rip all the way through and they can bleed out, out from their heart. Um, and those patients can pass away quite quickly or if they don't, they get very, very sick very quickly. Um, so something unfortunately we can we can see in these guys. So some of the staging systems that we use in regards to classification, um, some of our other conditions have adopted this as well. Um, but we have A through D. Um, there was an older scheme and then a newer scheme. So if people are familiar with this, um, it may sound a little different than maybe what you would have heard of 10 years ago, um, but relatively the same, I would say. Um, so A is going to be breeds that are at a higher risk, which is essentially every single small breed dog. Um, so nothing really that you need to be doing at that stage. Um, if you want it to be very cautious, you could always have somebody, a cardiologist, your primary care, listen to your pet and see if there's anything that they hear abnormal. Um, if you want it to just be doing, having echocardiograms done, you can, um, but nothing that's actually present at that stage. It's just that they are predisposed to developing it. B1 is going to be dogs that actually do have the condition. So their valves are thicker than they should be. There is a leak that is there. Um, their hearts may still be very normal in size though. Um, and then this is kind of part that's a little bit different than what it used to be. Um, it may be either normal or it could be a little bit bigger in size than what it should be, but still no medications are warranted at this stage. There's no indication that initiation of medications in the B1 stage is going to change their progression necessarily, but we do need to watch them closely and, and monitor for any changes and how quickly those changes may happen. Because then in our next stage, the B2 stage, that is when we can start medications and it has been proven to help delay the development of congestive heart failure or fluid in the lungs. Um, so we typically are recommending at least a medication called Pimobendin, also called Betmedin, because it was shown to help delay the onset of congestive heart failure by about 15 months. Um, so we have different cutoffs that we use, and you can kind of see that listed here um, on our echo of the size of the left atrium, the top chamber on the left side, the left ventricle bottom chamber. Once they meet those cutoffs, we say, okay, we are at this heart size, at least moderate heart enlargement that we should start them on the Pimobendin. They're going to be on that lifelong twice a day. Um, it's going to help with the pump ability of the heart. It's also going to help dilate blood vessels out on further. So it's easier to have that heart pump blood forward. Um, but we know definitively at this stage that that medication is going to be helpful for these guys. So we would recommend that for your pet if, if we feel like their heart size based on their weight meets these cutoffs and these guidelines. C is easy to remember because it's congestive heart failure. So that is when fluid is developing. There are various other medications that we'd want to start in these guys specifically. And the most important is going to be a diuretic with furosemide being the most common one that we are using. Um, there's many others that we can use. Um, a lot more information is coming out now. And I think a lot of us are switching even earlier on to a more potent diuretic called torzamide. Um, but those are going to be loop diuretics that we're using commonly to try to clear that fluid from the lungs. Um, in addition to the Pimobendin, we also want to use medications to help offset this neurohormonal system that gets activated in the body with really severe heart disease. Um, and those categories of drugs are going to be ACE inhibitors. So enalapril, benazapril, those may be medications that you're familiar with. Um, they also help lower the blood pressure a little bit. Spironolactone is technically a weak diuretic, but we're also using it more so to help offset that RAS system, which is that neurohormonal system. Um, it kind of acts as another leg to that system that we want to kind of cut off so that the heart muscle isn't impacted adversely by that system. Um, and it helps keep the potassium within range, which can go down as a result of the furosemide. D, unfortunately, we do see a lot of here, um, which are going to be the refractory patients. So these patients that have been in congestive heart failure potentially several times, um, they have secondary things then happening, bad arrhythmias maybe, um, 
kidney dysfunction, um, development of high blood pressure in the lungs. So they might be really hard to really get under control. And no matter what we're doing, they are their congestive heart failure is taking over and we cannot get that under control. Um, so those are definitely the, the sad cases that we see and, and see pretty commonly, unfortunately. So this is what we see very commonly every single day. Um, so if you try to remember the normals that I pulled up before, um, you could see how much bigger this heart actually is. So here is our right parasternal long axis. So this is the left side of the heart, top left chamber, which is quite big, bottom left chamber, quite big. And then this valve is thicker. Um, it's kind of buckling if you see into the left atrium. We put color over that and you could see that green squirting on up into the top. That's that leak across the mitral valve called mitral regurgitation. And that's why that heart is starting to stretch because it's getting that extra volume. Here's just a zoom in of that valve so you can kind of get a better um, visualization of what that valve actually is going to look like and how, how thick it is. It just looks very floppy um, more so than it, than it should. Some other views that we're doing on our echo and keep in mind, I mean, when we do an echo, we're getting lots of, of images. I'd say at least 30, commonly 60 um, of these little video loops of different ways that we're looking at the heart. Um, so if you're wondering, you know, what takes us so long to do them and measure them, that's, that's kind of why, but these are generally the images that we're getting. So this is from the left side, actually. Um, and we call this the left apical four chamber. So this bottom one on the right is actually the left atrium, left ventricle above it, and then right atrium, right ventricle. So this left heart, especially the right heart a little bit as well, um, but this left heart especially is quite big. There's actually a little bit of fluid around this heart um, and this patient had pretty, pretty severe heart disease. Um, this is the same one with color over it. You could see that blood squirting from the left ventricle into that left atrium. So that green is blood going in that opposite direction. And this is actually a continuous wave Doppler signal. So we could actually measure the speed of that. So we kind of have the, the probe up here at the top of that point. And then you see this horizontal line going across. If blood is moving away from the probe, it's going to go down from that baseline. So this U-shaped thing here is actually the speed of that mitral regurgitation. And then we have these positive profiles here, which is actually the normal blood that's filling the left ventricle as it should, um, but we can actually assess the, the speed of that too. And it looks like it's almost at about two meters per second, which is quite high an indication of pretty high pressures that are on that left side of that heart. So in interest of time, we'll, we'll try to get through several more diseases, um, but figured I'd start with the most common that we're seeing. The next is going to be, especially in larger breed dogs, so dilated cardiomyopathy or DCM. So this is going to be a primary myocardial disorder, so of the heart muscle, um, that leads to dilation and systolic dysfunction. And systolic dysfunction means dysfunction of the pumping system of the heart. A lot of times we're going to see that the left ventricle is the main one that's impacted, so the bottom chamber on the left side, um, but both ventricles can definitely be impacted with this disease. There's actually a lot of information that's out there of um, a genetic link in various breeds and different breeds have different genetic links um, or at least how they think that it's passed on. The large and giant breed dogs are definitely going to be those that are more predisposed. Some spaniels are going to be predisposed. Um, some of our main breeds that we see being impacted with this disease are going to be our Dobermans, Great Danes, German Shorthair Pointer, Wolfhounds, Newfies, um, Boxers. So we can definitely see a lot of these guys being impacted with this disease process. Um, with it, we have fibrosis or scarring that's present within the heart muscle, um, and then secondary remodeling that's happening as a result. And there's kind of two different categories that we see when we're looking under a microscope on histology of what these, what this muscle actually looks like, this heart muscle. And we have these ones that are classified into the wavy fiber type, um, which literally looks like a swirl, um, and then a fibro fatty type. So it has fibrous or scarring tissue and then fat infiltrating as well. Now we have various stages of this condition as well. So there's the preclinical, so kind of before signs develop. Um, 
a cult or a cult stage, and then the clinical stage when they start to be showing those signs. Um, some of the major outcomes that we see with this condition are heart failure development, both left and right sided arrhythmias. Um, we can see passing away suddenly from this condition, um, or they just really don't feel well, whether it's from congestive heart failure, poor output from their heart, um, and they just feel really crummy. So they wind up being euthanized. Um, having arrhythmias with this condition, especially since it's of the heart muscle, this disorder is really, really common. We can see abnormal beats from the bottom chamber called ventricular arrhythmias. Atrial fibrillation, which is that chaotic one that you guys heard before, happens pretty commonly. Um, again, passing away from these arrhythmias can, can definitely happen and can happen quite quickly, unfortunately. There's a lot of secondary causes of a heart that looks like it has DCM as well. We can see deficiencies, um, whether it's related to certain substances in, in the food, whether it's endocrine diseases. They might have been receiving a chemotherapeutic agent that caused their heart muscle to change. They might have eaten something that impacted their heart muscle. Um, sometimes if the heart is beating so, so fast, potentially from an infection, um, it kind of fatigues and tires on out. Um, so that can definitely impact the heart function. But you can kind of see in this cartoon image, the difference of, of normal compared to dilated cardiomyopathy, how much wider and rounder that heart muscle really is of both sides. Um, the ventricles, the pumping chambers, that that wall is just way more thin than it, it used to be. And we'll get better um, visuals of that in some of the echoes. It can actually be quite challenging sometimes with um, giving a definitive diagnosis of this, um, especially when they're kind of in this equivocal range. I mentioned that this is um, seen most commonly in larger breed dogs, but a lot of larger breed dogs, when we're measuring our parameters for the pumpability of the heart, measure normally at the low end of normal. Um, so if we're getting some of these numbers, you know, we might have a conversation with you of maybe this is normal for your athletic dog, but it may be early indication of disease. Um, we might want to watch them at least one or two more times to make sure that we're not seeing progression versus if it seems really stable, it may just be normal for that, that dog. Um, so various things that we're kind of looking at on, on echo um, that may make us think more likely or less likely that the disease is actually present. Um, so we can be paying attention to how dilated things are. Um, we can look at various ways to measure that pumpability on the echo. Um, we can see, is it dilated or is it just the pumpability that's impacted? Is the top chamber of the heart impacted? Um, is the relaxation ability of the heart impacted? Is there any secondary leaks that are occurring? Um, so those are some of the things that we're paying attention to on the echo. Um, and then some of just the actual clinical things that we will be paying attention to, are they fainting? Are we hearing an arrhythmia? Is it a breed that we expect to see this disease in, um, a breed that tends to have one of these genetic mutations? Um, so, you know, we combine a lot of these things to try to help make the disease more or less probable, depending on what we're being given in the clinic. This is just something I, I just wanted everyone to be exposed to and see. Um, so there's lots of... Um, genes I mentioned that we know about and actually places that can test for them if you were interested. So this is specifically for Dobermans, um, where there are several mutations that we know of um, and NCSU tests for some of those. So you can actually send out on your on your dog and see specifically in these breeds, um, it, does my dog have this? And if so, it kind of goes through the likelihood that they would develop disease. What's hard about any of these genetic mutations is just because your pet has it doesn't guarantee always that they're going to develop the disease. Um, some of them you can see on here, it's very high risk if they have this mutation. Um, but some of them, if your pet doesn't have it, maybe they will still develop the disease, but they just don't have that particular mutation. They may have some other mutation that we just don't know about or some other exposure that caused them to develop the disease. Um, and this is really with any of these diseases that we're, we're going through. Um, but there's lots out there that we can kind of test for if you were interested um, of kind of knowing if your pet has these um, genetic mutations.
So this is what we're seeing on, on the echo. Um, so you can see here that heart is just more dilated than it should. And that pump ability compared to some of those other dogs, especially the, the degenerative valve disease dogs, it's really not squeezing with that vigor that we expect to see. Um, here's our one where I mentioned the heart muscles like this, and we kind of cut through it um, and look at it this way. So similarly, it's really not squeezing well. Um, this is at the base of the heart, and you can actually appreciate this is a top left chamber, left atrium is really, really big in this dog. Um, so this is, I'd say, moderately impacted. This is one dog and this is a different dog. Um, so we can see ones that are honestly way worse than this as well. Just a slide that I wanted to put on here because I think it's something we talk about so, so commonly. Um, and I think a lot of people want to know about. So this will be one of the things I'll try to um, get some resources for you guys on. But we can definitely see diet, unfortunately, impacting dogs and cats, but more commonly we'll, we've been seeing it with dogs and causing a heart to look like DCM. Um, as of the more recent report that the FDA has released, there's been a total of um, 1,382 dogs that have been reported. Doesn't mean obviously there's not more than that um, that have actually occurred. So there's these nutritional causes that can lead to the heart muscle looking abnormal and looking like DCM. There are deficiencies that are present. I have some of those listed on out. Um, we know of carnitine, thiamine. Those have been identified to cause DCM, um, but not with these particular causes that we're kind of displaying in through the FDA. Some of the annoyances with some of these deficiencies is that we have abilities to test in blood levels, but the blood levels aren't always as representative of what's actually in the heart muscle. Um, we can definitely test it. And if it's low, it probably truly is low. But if it's normal, it, it may be a little bit hard to kind of interpret or know what to do with that. Um, we can have the levels of certain nutrients or compounds that are actually too high in certain diets. Um, and that may be causing their heart to be impacted. The diet may just not be well balanced. And, you know, no matter how good we think that we're doing with making a diet, it, it may be missing certain vitamins, minerals, they're going to have different dietary needs than we do. Um, so if you are interested in cooking for your pet or, or doing something similar, we always, always strongly recommend consulting with a boarded veterinary nutritionist, which are out there. A lot of them do um, phone consults online consults. So you don't even necessarily have to physically see them, but they're going to make sure that your, your dog or cat is going to be getting everything that they need in their diet and then make sure that you feel comfortable with what they're actually being exposed to. If you weren't comfortable with some of the commercial diets, um, what's important with this is that these hearts can actually improve over time, um, compared to some of these more genetic DCM dogs that, you know, some of them don't really make it very long um, once they go into congestive heart failure. It can take, though, months to years to start to see significant changes occur to these heart, this heart muscle when it's impacted from the diet. Sometimes it'll change completely. Sometimes it's partially. Sometimes it's happened so long. There's so much scarring that has formed that we can't get it back to normal again. Um, the biggest thing is going to be changing their diet. Some of them may need medications, at least in the interim. Um, some may be able to get off medications, which is great. Um, but really giving them time and, and switching off that diet is really important. Um, if you've read about this or seen anything out there, it's actually not just the grain freeze that we're seeing impact at this point. Um, we now term them more these non-traditional diets. So it's those that now we're seeing have are high in pulses. So I have kind of listed in there what um, pulses typically are. We also see potatoes, sweet potatoes. So if you're seeing these things in like the top 10 ingredients, then ideally we would want you to switch them. Um, and usually it's when they've been on the diet for a bit of time. So a year or so um, that their hearts are being impacted by it. So this is, you know, just a very brief mention of, of why you may hear us when you're coming to cardio or your primary care bring up the diet to you because we're seeing pretty severe um, disease and, and passing away from this disease from these diets, unfortunately. Um, tumors. So tamponade um, is going to be when actually fluid develops within the sac that's normally surrounding the heart muscle. Um, check the time. 
we'll go through this. I want to, I think I have cats next. I want for the cat people on here, I'll go through at least just a couple of the cat things so you see that. Um, but I believe they'll send out some of my images because there's so much more on here too. Um, and I definitely am not going to get to it. So I want to make sure everybody has some exposure to, to some of the things on here. But we see this a lot in regards to the tumors. So I think we'll, we'll try to get through that and some of the cat things, I think if, if everyone were okay with that. Um, but again, there's fluid that can build up within the sac or that's around the heart. Um, and then it starts to actually impinge and, and push on the heart muscle itself. Um, and it's going to impact its ability to fill it can then lead to pleural effusion, which is fluid around the lungs or abdominal effusion fluid in the belly. Again, the, the heart is going to be compressed. And since the right side of the heart, normally the pressure there isn't very high, the right side gets smushed even more so and prevents its filling. The rate of that accumulation is going to be really important. Um, so if it builds up really quickly, that sac has had absolutely no time to really accommodate for that extra fluid. So it can't stretch out. And instead that fluid is going to push in and smush in on that heart versus if it's slowly happening, that sac has had time to kind of stretch on out. So the heart isn't as impacted in those cases, but definitely if it's a large enough volume, it's, it's going to start to not feel well. That's going to lead to reduced cardiac output, um, which can definitely lead to collapse in patients, weakness, um, and can cause them to pass away suddenly. We have various causes that we can see. Most commonly, we'll, we're going to see tumors, especially in older dogs. Um, idiopathic, so for an unknown reason, there can be inflammation of the sac around the heart that can cause the fluid and thankfully not see an actual tumor that's there. Um, hemangiosarcoma is one of the most common tumors that we see in the dog It's of the heart. It's typically impacting the right heart. Other ones that are out there are going to be chemodectomas, lymphoma, ectopic thyroid, um, mesothelioma. Sometimes these chemodectomas, which are heart-based tumors, we'll see a lot in um, the bully breeds, and that they can get so, so big. They can start smushing in on things in the chest, really impact the vessels that are coming out from the, the base of the heart, um, and then cause secondary fluid from that, collapse episodes from that. Um, we could actually place stents in those dogs sometimes in certain situations. Um, to try to hold open those vessels if they're being smushed on down by these masses. In cats, tumors are, are going to be a little less common to be causing the pericardial effusion, um, which is the fluid around the heart. We see congestive heart failure causing fluid around the heart. It's usually not a huge amount, um, but that is one of the most common ones that we'll see. Um, infectious diseases like FIP, cancers can do it. Um, we can see tumors. Lymphoma is one of the most common ones that we see of the heart in cats in particular. Um, it's just not as much as we'll see congestive heart failure leading to fluid. The frustrating part when we have these patients that have pericardial effusion is we may remove that fluid, but it's kind of this ticking time bomb and that fluid can redevelop at any point annoyingly and, and scarily. So this is what that's going to look like. So you can see the heart here, um, and then there's this dark black area that's around it, and then the bright line. So that bright line is actually that pericardial sac, which normally you were seeing directly adherent to the actual heart muscle, but now there's this space of fluid that's around. Similarly here, so this is that short axis view. So we have left ventricle, the crescent of the right ventricle, and then this darker space that's around it is all the fluid that's built up around that heart muscle. Um, so this is an emergency situation and we actually have to remove that fluid um, with a procedure called a pericardiocentesis. Um, so what we do is place an IV catheter in these dogs um, to give them some sedation. We monitor their rhythm really closely. They can have arrhythmias or abnormal heartbeats as we're doing this, but you can see we're doing it sterilely. So the dog's chest is shaved, we scrub it. Um, part of the reason we sedate them is because we don't want them to move as we're putting this needle into their chest. Um, so we are wearing our sterile gloves. We use ultrasound to help find kind of the best area to go. And we put that needle on in and drain that fluid. A lot of times it is blood. I'd say most of the time it is blood. Um, and we can actually send that fluid out for analysis. So here's one of the more common locations that we'll see it is at the tip of the right oracle, which is kind of this little ear that's hanging off the right atrium. So that's a mass that's right here. This patient got a CT scan of, of her chest um, and this darker area of the heart is the actual mass that's present. Here's another one of a, of a CT um, where a few different views, head is this way, abdomen's this way, 
head here, abdomen here, um, and here's this large mass pushing on the heart. That's here. Large mass and the heart kind of smashed over here in the lungs. And you can see there's honestly minimal lung space in this dog because the mass is taking up so, so much space. Um, and this is kind of going front to back. So front of the dog to the back of the dog where this is the mass and this is the heart, almost equal in size. Skip through these. These are just mm -hmm. a, a bunch of other same things, um, but we'll get through some of the cats um, so that everyone who is a cat lover can get some of that information at least. Um, so our feline cardiomyopathies. Um, this is from the consensus statement that is kind of going to go into how do we classify these because there's lots of different heart muscle disorders. Um, HCM or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is going to be the most common one that we see. Um, so that's obviously our biggest bubble that's there. We can see secondary things impacting that as, as well. So high thyroid, high blood pressure. So you see hyperthyroidism, hypertension, um, reduced preload. So if there's not a lot of blood that's going into the heart, if they're dehydrated, um, neoplastic infiltration, cancers within the heart muscle, transient myocardial thickening or TMT is something that we'll see not commonly, um, but especially in some of the younger cats where it'll just be present for a short period of time. Um, acromegaly is another, you know, different systemic illness that can impact the, the heart muscle and make the heart look like HCM. Um, so that's when that wall muscle is getting thicker than it should. You see that smaller bubble is kind of the end stage. We can call those the burnout HCMs where they might start to actually throw clots to their heart muscle. It may start to thin. It might not squeeze very well. They may actually start to get dilated. Their heart is really fatigued and, and really burnt out um, at, at this stage. We have DCM actually in cats, not very common, but we can definitely see it. So it looks actually exactly similar to what I went through with the dogs. It gets more dilated and does not squeeze well. Um, especially years and years ago, there were diet things that could be associated with the development. Um, but other things as well can can lead to it. Um, ARVC, if people have boxers, bulldogs, and you're interested, I have actually at the end of this, which unfortunately we're, we're not going to reach it, but when you get the PowerPoint, you can look into some of that information as well. Um, but ARVC is arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Um, we can actually see that in cats too, where the right side of the heart can get more dilated. Um, it can actually get quite thin, especially in cats. Whereas in dogs, we don't really see a, in the early stages, a lot of those structural changes in these guys. RCM is restrictive cardiomyopathy. Um, those ones, the wall is going to be normal thickness, but the top chambers are gonna get really, really big because those bottom chambers are not going to relax very well to allow that blood to pump on down to the bottom. And then we have this oddball nonspecific where we honestly see quite commonly here. You might see us call it unclassified cardiomyopathy, um, which is a little bit of an older term, but it's basically a heart that is not normal. We can clearly see that it is not normal, but it really isn't fitting into one of these categories. And here's just kind of a description of what we're looking for on the echo of how we're classifying these cats. Um, but if we see that it's not right, but we, it's not thick, it's not dilated. Um, we can't call them certain ones of these conditions. So we might have to put them in their own category, which honestly, I do feel like we, we actually see a lot here at, at the AMC. So HCM is the most common one that we see in cats. Um, it's incidence is between eight to 27%, which with HCM being over 90% um, of those feline cardiomyopathies, in HCM, there's idiopathic hypertrophy or thickening of the heart muscle on histopathology. So under the microscope, we'll see the fibers of the heart muscle being all malaligned. Um, it's going to be a disease of diastolic dysfunction. So it's going to impact the relaxation ability of the heart. Those ventricles are not going to be dilated um, and there's not going to be other loading conditions that are impacting them. So not a high blood pressure that they're trying to push against or things similar um, that's making them become thick as a result. Certain breeds, if you guys have them, Maine Coons, Ragdolls, which are my favorite and what I have, um, Sphinx cats, those, those cats have known genetic predispositions, unfortunately. Um, so very important if you do have a cat of those breeds, um, would not be wrong for, to have a screening done. 
we can see obstructions happening as that heart is squeezing. Um, various things can happen to the heart. So we have SAM here, which is an abnormal motion of the mitral valve that causes obstruction out of the heart. Um, the ventricle might kind of smack against itself and lead to obstruction. So those can lead to murmurs that we're hearing in some of these cats. I mentioned how other systemic illnesses can impact the heart muscle as well. As that heart uh, is trying to pass blood from the top chambers to the bottom chambers, since the bottom chambers are more stiff, those top chambers get really, really big. And this is honestly in any of these feline cardiomyopathies, not even just HCM. But when that top chamber gets really, really big, the function reduces and they can develop clots there. Um, we can see that the long-term prognosis for those cats is, is quite poor um, and they can develop clots within that chamber and it just gets thrown out to, to circulation and obstructs blood flow. Unfortunately, the end result, usually after years in, in congestive heart failure, these, these cats will go into congestive heart failure. They can have ATEs or arterial thromboembolisms and SCD is sudden cardiac death. Whoop. Um, this I think is just, you guys can kind of look at that on your own. Um, these are just kind of risk factors, prognostic indicators in some of these cats. This is just a good chart of kind of, you can look through it when you get it, um, of just kind of seeing that as they have had the disease longer, how many cats are still alive, how many of them are impacted um, by certain things. So CHF being congestive heart failure, ATE being arterial thromboembolism, and then sudden death. So here is a cat with HCM, um, so thicker walls that are present here, um, but actually still a normal left atrium. This is that short axis view, especially this free wall here is thicker than it should. It actually has this little line here, we call that a false tendon. And then this is that M mode, so just kind of that still image representation, which this is the outer wall of the left ventricle, the black is the blood in the left ventricle, this gray is the middle wall of the ventricles, and then this is the outer wall of the right ventricle. Cats can also get DCM. So I mentioned that before. Um, so you can see how dilated this heart is of all chambers. It's really very poor at squeezing. Um, similarly that you see here and, and quite dilated, especially this top chamber on the left side. This is some of the um, evidence of building up clots in, in these guys. So this this little guy had really bad HCM. You could see how thick that heart muscle is. I don't know how well you can actually visualize it um, across the screen, but there is some swirling in this top chamber. So that's consistent with stagnant blood flow. Similarly here, you can see how big this left atrium is and that swirling blood, it kind of just looks like fuzziness within it. This is the oracle of the left atrium. That's the most common place where a clot forms. And this should be all black. And it has all this gray schmoo within it. You can see an actual formed clot spinning around in the left atrium in this bottom right one. Um, and as I was doing that echo, I couldn't see it anymore. And it detached and went and obstructed blood flow um, elsewhere in this, in this patient. And this is just a still image of that same location, the oracle, and a clot that's formed within that oracle in this cat. Um, so definitely sad when we when we see these types of things. When we just see the smoke or we see it in the heart, we'll put them on blood thinners. Um, but, you know, we want to reduce that risk as much as possible. We just completely can't stop that from happening. Um, so you'll see us use things called clopidogrel. We may use rivaroxaban or apixaban. We might use anoxaparin. Um, there's several drugs that we may use, but clopidogrel or Plavix is the one that we know based on a big study that has um, definitive proof that it reduces their risk significantly when it's compared to aspirin. Um, but some of these other drugs we'll use commonly, especially in these guys that we see things like this in with how severe it is, because we want to try to reduce that risk as much as possible. Um, but I know I'm over time. Um, I want to give people some time for questions just so that you have a little bit of a, an update of what you can potentially see in some extra slides. I have information on congestive heart failure, um, what that means, what we might see on, on x-rays. Um, I have... Uh, <laughs> And then, then all the arrhythmia things. Um, so you can kind of see what those look like um, and kind of the normal conduction through the heart. When they get this, Michelle, are they able to like play some of these things or I feel like maybe no? 
Uh, well, if you don't go through it, it won't be on the recording, but we can, if okay. you want to make these available, we can send out the slot, okay. like some of these. Yeah. Um, okay. And we can, we would love to have you back as well. This is, okay. I know this is a lot, this is a big topic, but know, you've done a, like, so a, much, so like a fantastic job. So lots yeah. of great compliments and thank you. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would love to take it. We do have some questions. I mean, is there, mm -hmm. do you want to finish any of these or? Um, yeah, let me know. Yeah. I mean, I know that I think, you have a I think long the only thing I think that might just be cool for people to see yeah. is um, for some of the arrhythmias or abnormal heartbeats, we can actually place pacemakers in, in our pets. So cats and dogs, um, usually we're going to be doing it for the heartbeats that are causing the heart to go quite slow and the patients are becoming symptomatic for that. Um, so here's an image of a pacemaker in a dog. Um, I know this is small. I'll do another one too, but you can see kind of this string going on down. We call that the lead and it's going actually into the heart muscle um, and it's telling the heart to beat. And we're able to program the battery pack, which we call the generator and put different settings of what heart rates do we want it to function at? How um, high do we want it to go? How much activity until we start to make that heart rate go up? Um, we can kind of test to make sure it's working appropriately. So we have these pets come in on a routine basis right after they get the surgery done, we see them a lot more commonly. And then once things have been in there for a bit, we kind of space it out. Um, but we can definitely do that in, in dogs as well as cats. We try to do it by the cardio service going interventionally. And we put that through the jugular vein in the neck. Um, but in some of the really tiny guys, if they're a super, super small dog or cats, um, the surgeons do it and they actually make an incision in the abdomen and go through the diaphragm and actually stitch that um, pacemaker lead to the actual heart muscle itself um, to actually allow that heart to, to beat more regularly when it wasn't. Um, so here's just a, a common disease that we see called sick sinus syndrome where the heart just completely stops beating for several seconds at a time. Um, so here you can kind of see a strip of all these beats that are happening. And this is an artifact. When I have this flat line, the heart just truly stops beating. And as you can imagine, just like you or I, if we didn't have any beats for lines long, um, no blood is leaving that heart. Um, so this, this girl got a pacemaker. Um, there's two little lines in here because we actually had to, she was fainting so frequently that we had to emergently put a temporary pacemaker in, which is something that we do when they're still awake. We just, it's just a little tiny, kind of like a, um, a normal blood draw poke, um, get a temporary pacemaker lead in that is causing the heart to beat when they're still awake in the interim, then we can anesthetize them just so that they're at a safer point um, and put the real one in, take the temporary one on on out. Um, but we can definitely do these procedures if, if it's indicated. Um, again, we're going to be doing these typically for the rhythms that cause the heart to go quite slow and cause them to be fainting or, or weak as a result. But yeah, I'll, I'll send, I'll send these and, and people can look on through. Um, I think there's a lot of people who have bulldog type breeds, boxers, so they may be interested in some of these ending ones. Um, you're familiar with Holter monitors. So um, if people are interested in that, I, I think they can definitely take a look at this and see anything that they um, might find of value. Okay, great. Um, if you want to, to unshare your screen mm -hmm. yeah wonderful um then we'll take just some questions but this was really I, I, so fantastic we're getting so many people are just saying thank you so much and everyone wants you back so hopefully you <laughs> will come back so um let me just get through a few questions um <clears throat> does having congenital heart disease increase the likelihood of developing acquired heart disease as the pet ages no, not necessarily in regards to causing it to develop an acquired heart disease. I would say what's tricky is that um, certain congenital heart diseases will then secondarily impact the heart muscle in a certain way that then if they get an acquired heart disease that does the same type of thing, they have kind of a double whammy. So for example, let's say they have um, a malformation of the mitral valve that they were born with and a leak that's there, and that is already causing the left side of the heart to get bigger. And then later on, they get acquired degeneration of that valve and get even greater of a leak. Um, they're just, unfortunately, not starting at a, as good of a spot as a dog that didn't have that problem from the, from the get-go. So I would not say that they are more predisposed to it, but they can definitely have um, secondary effects that are kind of 
a double hit to the heart muscle at the at the same time. Okay. Um, does cardiovascular exercise in dogs help prevent or mitigate heart disease? Not necessarily. I mean, just like us, uh, we don't want them to be, even though I love chubby things as much as <laughs> anyone, but um, we don't want our, our pets to be too obese um, in, in any way, just because there's so many systemic effects, not even just the heart that are impacted. Um, but it's always a little bit tricky. I feel like when we have our owners come in, they always ask about, you know, what to do exercise wise, because you think about trying to keep up with that cardiovascular health. And especially once the pet has heart disease, we actually try to limit their exercise a little bit, not because it's terrible for them, but I think it's just really hard for us to know how much they can tolerate. So usually what I'm telling people is to have their pet kind of dictate how much that they can actually do, um, because we don't want to push them too hard because we unknowingly may make their hearts work harder than they need to. Um, and all of us, I feel like have either seen or have some of those dogs that will not stop no matter what, no matter how bad their hearts are. Um, and they may not even realize that it's too much for them. Um, but yeah, I would say as a preventative before anything, not, you know, there's not anything that I would say, you know, have your dog walk a mile every day to, to prevent this from happening. Unfortunately, no. Okay. Um, we had um, a question about, I see dietary so sodium restriction starting at B2 stage. What if the pet is on a urinary diet? Most urinary diets, she said, has uh, sodium added to encourage the pet to drink. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I would say a lot that we'll, we talk about is um, more so at least the treats. I tell people to avoid the salty treats for um, as best as possible. Um, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's challenging, especially if your pet has numerous conditions to prioritize which one is, is, or is not more important. Um, I usually am not telling people that they need to switch completely to a low sodium diet until they have been in congestive heart failure, because that's when we do have that definitive data. The other hard part, honestly, is that although I would love for all these patients, once they're in congestive heart failure to be on low sodium diets, we also battle a lot with once they're in congestive heart failure with these dogs and cats eating. Um, mm. And if they don't like how the diet tastes, they're not going to eat it. And then if they already don't feel great because they've been in congestive heart failure, I sometimes just want them to eat anything. So although I would love for this to be possible, it's sometimes not. So in those particular situations, you know, we have pets that are diabetics um, and they need to be on a specific food for that or have food allergies. And, you know, we have to just kind of balance that if they have another condition going on that is impacting them more. So I'd have them, you know, be on their urinary diet if they're on it for stones, et cetera, um, because I don't want that to happen. And then let's say they do, and they need surgery to remove those stones and then their heart is too sick to get that surgery. So I'd rather them be on something that can kind of prevent another issue from developing in the future for them. Okay, great. Um, what is a normal range of heartbeats per minute for medium to large dogs? So it, um, it's, it's a good question. So I'd say on average, so when we do those holters, those monitors that they're wearing for the 24 hour period, um, typically we'll have for the mean about 70, 80 ish. Some of the large giant breed dogs can be even lower than that. Um, not dramatically, um, but a little bit lower, but then we will see very commonly dogs can drop into the twenties, thirties as their minimum. Um, and then on those holders, I'm able to kind of look through the hourly, um, as well as scroll through every single heartbeat. It's really helpful when you guys kind of know what they're doing throughout the day, because if you tell me they were napping and then I go and I see their heart rate was 30, I don't really care that much versus if they were running around and their heart rate was 30, they may honestly not have been running around because they're not getting enough, um, of that cardiac output out. Um, so we sometimes will actually even do them. Like I have many patients that, you know, they might be really anxious coming into the hospital and in the hospital setting, I expect them, let's say a very, very anxious dog. I would expect its heart rate to be 140. Um, but I'm listening and I'm only getting 80. It's a little weird for an anxious dog in hospital. So I might have them wear that monitor to see what is their average heart rate when, when they are at home. And maybe when they're at home, um, that larger breed dog is at 40, um, which is very unusual. So 
we pay close attention to kind of those average heart rates, but I'd say typically in when they're just kind of casual, um, about 70 ish or so would be what I would expect. Um, but it really just depends on what they're doing, their stress level, their excitement level, um, sleeping, et cetera, things like that. But, um, but yeah. Okay, great. Um, we have a question, um, from a, a human cardiologist, um, mm-hmm. said he recognized, that some standard treatments for people are not necessarily used for animals, for example, beta blockers, blockers for DCM or HCM. Do vets use human data and therapies? Or, yeah, 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 I know. I feel like this <laughs> this is a long one that we can talk about for a while. So, this is like a one health one, maybe we need I to, know. you know, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, most of the things that we're doing are stemmed off of or based off of the human correlate that we have. Um, You know, we may have some drugs that we use that aren't used, but I'd say for the most part, a lot of them are used in, in humans. I didn't even delve too much into the drug therapies, but a lot of the antiarrhythmics that we're using are the same. Um, We might use them though in a little bit different of a purpose for specific types of arrhythmias that we're using. Um, in regards to some of the beta blockers, I mean, certain beta blockers, um, some of my mentors in school would use in some DCM, the preclinical stages, but having owners monitor really closely um, is also quite hard. Um, So, and making sure that they're not impacted and we're not doing harm by doing it um, is going to be challenging. The other hard part that we have just in our field is just the sheer sample size that we can get for any of our studies um, when we're doing it and trying to base things off of some of the human counterparts is that our sample size is so low. So we might find something to maybe not be significant, but we may just have such a small sample size that maybe if we knew more, we would. Um, But yeah, I mean, definitely we there's a lot more studies that are coming out on various drugs that people are using. And then I think as more of that data comes out, then we would use it more. So um, a lot of people are talking about things like Entresto and such now, um, Mm -hmm. and people do use that in, in veterinary medicine. It's just not as common right now. Um, But there are definitely studies on it. So usually we are basing that from what's happening in, in the human medicine field, and then trying to see if it would work in a similar way for our patients for, for the most part, but hundred percent, there are going to be differences in, in some of these patients. Okay, great. Um, just a few more, um, are non-traditional diets affecting cats parts as well? They are, it's just not as common that we're seeing it. Um, so we definitely saw, well, not me, it was before I was mm-hmm. born, but um, years and years ago, there was taurine deficiency a lot more in, in cats, um, but a lot of the brands have fixed their diets and, and gotten that to go away. Um, but we still will see it, but a hundred percent, it is not as common now as we're seeing it in dogs. Um, so I wouldn't be as overly fearful, but at the same time, I would still try to avoid um, as best as possible kind of those those grain frees. And just kind of as a reminder, because we definitely do have people um, just knowing that your cats should in theory be eating eating meat. Um, so making sure that that's, that's in diets. We have definitely seen cats that are um, not eating meat and we can definitely see them being impacted as a result. Okay, great. All right, a couple more. Um... Uh, my toy poodle was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. She was coughing, but since being put on meds, she's not coughing. What can be done if she begins having labored breathing? So yeah. I guess it depends on what meds um, your poodle was put on, but typically, so let's say she or he was put on those four medications that I mentioned, we start at, at stage C. Um, unfortunately, when we have patients go into congestive heart failure from any of these diseases, we can only control it for so long, they will eventually relapse um, and start to show those signs that you mentioned. And there's definitely things that we can do to try to offset that. So typically one of the main things that we'll do is bump up the diuretic. Um, so if if they are on already furosemide, which they should be if they've been in congestive heart failure or torzomide, um, might be the, the drug that your pet's on we kind of choose a percentage of an increase and go up on that. We watch closely the kidney values because we can see that those can rise. Um, But that's typically what we do. But there's lots of tweaks and adjustments of different medications, frequencies, the amount of milligrams that they're getting. But in general, the main thing that we're doing is going up on the diuretic. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Okay. I know it's very late. So thank you so much, Dr. Kochi, for this 
wonderful, like very thorough presentation and for just taking the time to join us. Um, thank you, Kimberly, for doing such a wonderful job joining, our, uh, organizing our events. Um, just a reminder, we'll send out the link to the recording of tonight's event tomorrow afternoon. Our, and then our next lecture on brachiocephalic airway syndrome will be on Wednesday, June 28th. Um, okay, thank you again, Dr. Kochi, for sharing your time and knowledge with us. Um, and a very special thank you to all of you for spending part of your evening with us.